so I just want to make a couple points before we start. I'm going to be talking about uh, the role of the media, among other things, in war, and that's a kind of a touchy subject these days with all this business about fake news and respecting the media as being the guardians of democracy and all that. I'm going to challenge that, and I'm going to challenge it pretty forcefully, and I'm also going to uh, challenge the notion that one party, one political party or another, is actually uh, the peace party or the war party. There's one war party and it's Democrats and Republicans. So um, I want to make that point up front. So some people may get upset. I'll also be talking about the CIA and things that people have labeled conspiracy theories for reasons that we will go into. Um, so that may offend people too, so be prepared for that. Some of this is going to be controversial for some of you. For other people, they're going to think I'm too mellow to, to calm down. Because I, I recognize some faces in the audience. Uh, but this is about making sure that everybody starts out on the same page, understands the real causes of war, and the implications of that for how we can approach uh, our efforts to promote peace and end war. Okay. So I want to start by talking about the reasons that were given for war and having a little critique of that. Spreading democracy. How's that working? Can you, can you spread democracy at the point of a gun? <laughs> Serving your country. I do think that's a very interesting point. I was, I'm a veteran and I ask people not to thank me for my service in the military. I'm doing my duty now. So, uh, <laughs> and I think most people who are members of Veterans for Peace would say the same thing. Some get very upset. I appreciate that people mean well, but this is what I do. I try to educate people about why they should support uh, maybe, you know, healing the veterans, but also thinking about the civilians who are killed in much greater numbers. Yeah, I think that started in Sparta, the idea that people had to always be prepared for war, to bring your kids up that way. And it was also an idea promoted by Thomas Jefferson, who said the tree of liberty has to be watered with the blood of patriots every generation. So yeah, that certainly is carried through these days. Defense of our own lands. That might be actually a justifiable excuse. Have we ever had to defend uh, the United States from invasion. Anybody remember the War of 1812? Not personally, but <laughs> hearing about it. Who declared war in 1812? Yeah, it was us, and actually that was a war of conquest. We wanted to annex Canada. Uh, people in the Northeast actually talked about separating from the rest of the uh, United States, or the rest of the colonies, uh, or not, <laughs> United States, I'm sorry. Uh, they talked about separating from it. Uh, they had totally different ideas. Um, much of the country appreciated the help that they, we got from France. Other ones were still allied with Great Britain. Uh, are, and and uh, so it was a big problem back then. Uh, but the point is, we started the war, we were not really fighting in self-defense. We had to defend ourselves after they retaliated. And that's actually a theme that's resonant today in uh, Ukraine. Fighting terror, which is a tactic, with the military. How's that working out for us? Uh, have, we, have we eliminated terrorism or evil, as, as Bush said we were fighting? We've created more, exactly. So the problems got worse. Uh, are you seeing a pattern here? The excuses we're given don't seem to match up with the, the results. So either, either these are the stupidest people in the world running the country or they're really going for other agendas. What are the national interests? Do they ever define that? You ever seen that defined in the newspaper where they throw it out like everybody knows what it means? Pardon? There you go. It's not so much about prices, actually, as it is about uh, control of the world's uh, fossil fuel supplies, and oil being the most important one.
What, when do you think it was the first time the United States used the excuse we're, we're fighting for their rights, where, where we're going and, and invading, we're fighting the bad guys for their sake? The Civil War? Okay, to save the Union, which was good for all the people. Yeah, that's and that's actually, the, I mean, the and free the slaves. slaves. Although that was not the main rationale. No, but the abolitionists were uh, Absolutely, yeah, and it ended up doing that, but that was not the primary purpose. And had that been the only reason, they wouldn't have gone to war, I'm sure. But the, it, de it was declared the reason that we were going to fight in uh, uh, the Spanish-American War. We were going to help the Cubans who wanted independence from Spain. That was one of the main, not the only, but the main rationale. The, uh, the explosion of the main was uh, just a trigger that set it off. But uh, Hearst and others were already pushing for that. Free the world from tyranny, so we tyrannize. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and there's lots of examples you can think of that, huh? Assad the butcher. Uh, Hussein, the, I don't know, insane guy, uh, Gaddafi, the nut job, who's, you know, his people hate, even though he was actually very popular. Is war good for the economy? For some, yeah. But if, how about for the general overall economy and uh, average people? It, it absolutely is not. Now, the reason they say that was because in World War II, it was an exception. We needed to gear up production to get the economy going, so it made a big difference at that time. But in general, it is not a productive use of our money. Um, if we were investing in infrastructure, for instance, right now, instead of spending over a trillion dollars a year on wars and associated costs, uh, then uh, we, we would we'd be generating what economists generally estimate to be about $1.60 for every dollar we spend, as opposed to you buy bombs, you pay for every dollar you spend on a bomb, you get zero, except for a bunch of destruction in other countries. It actually costs money if we're gonna contribute to the rebuilding. But that money, of course, goes to the pockets of Bechtel and, and companies like that, US-based international Lockheed Martin, yeah. Right, in the Civil War, same thing, a lot of advantage. Now, does anybody here think that that was a, a good use of, uh, a good excuse for a war? No. Nah. <laughs> yeah, and it's okay to use torture because they're not really human. We've been saying that in one form or another in pretty much every war, too. Uh, not, wait, not so much in the Revolutionary War. Washington made it a major point not to torture prisoners like the British did. And we seem to have forgotten that. We revere him as the father of the country, but we forgot one of the main lessons that he taught us about war. How, how many times have you heard, we are the exceptional nation? If we don't in, enforce and defend the world order, who will, right? The Russians, the Chinese, they're the bad guys. So yeah, absolutely, you're right. And when I say excuse, I really mean rationale, um, because they don't think they need an excuse. You know, they, they're just, telling us why we have to do it, and we're supposed to accept that. And unfortunately, most of us do. We have to respond because they expect us to. They won't respect us if we don't respond with force. And uh, I'm thinking specifically about the Gulf of Tonkin. So they invented this incident. Uh, uh, well, they blew out of proportion the first attack, and, and they invented the second attack uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin to justify starting a war that almost nobody in Congress opposed. Does anybody remember the vote in the Senate on, uh, on the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? Wayne Morse. Wayne Morse was, I, I think he was one of two, or, or was it? The Jackson, um, Alaska. No, Gravel wasn't in yet, but no, but he, he is definitely a staunch uh, anti-war guy. Uh, I think it was uh, 98 to two, and, and Wayne Morse, he stood up, and then he got voted out of office the next election. So, uh, yes, Tom. We're in partnership with the United Nations. 
That's true. Um, you know, the Constitution says that Congress has to debate and approve a war before we go to war. But starting with Truman, we started doing things like police actions, where the UN would pass a resolution saying, OK, you can stop this aggression, and that, you know, that's it. And of course, we exceeded that mandate, and we're still there. And we claim there's a UN peacekeeping force there. It's not a UN peacekeeping force. It is a US-led occupying force. Does anybody here think peace, excuse me, that war is inevitable? OK, no, it is always a choice. So if you hear anybody say war is inevitable, Please challenge them. Challenge them like you would challenge them if they made a racist comment in public or in your presence. We have a part of us, at least, a biological part. I mean, if we were nothing but animals like all the other animals, then you could say, yeah, I mean, we're programmed to react to certain things with violence. But most of us, I think, believe we're not just animals. And there is another side of us. You can call it the spiritual side or the moral side, the side that's capable of higher reasoning, whatever you want. But it's not an animalistic reaction with violence to anything that provokes us, frightens us, scares us, scares us that they're going to take away our toys. Um, so we do always have that choice. In the animal world, you know, Ayn Rand tried to say that uh, the people are inherently selfish to address Bert's point about greed. But the fact of the matter is, most species have uh, s learned to survive by cooperation. And also, humans have, have done their best when they cooperate. So she's full of shit, of course. I, <laughs> I think probably most people here would agree with that. Um, ch again, challenge me if you disagree. Kipling wrote about the white man's burden. You know, everybody else is inferior. We have to help them. Uh, some people even tried to justify slavery of African Americans or Africans uh, by saying that it was our duty to Christianize them and raise them up to respect their betters. Well, you know, not only is that a real reason, but it's also that Mitt Romney explicitly said that in 2012 when he was running for president. He said, well, we can't, you know, we can't eliminate all those jobs. And the truth is our economy does depend on those jobs right now, but we can transition. And that's one of the things that World Beyond War is working on. Thanks for that lead in. Um, there's a book over here describing an educational program about how to convert to a peacetime economy. Um, unfortunately, I only have one copy, but you can obtain your own copy by going to worldbeyondwar.org. I think that's, I think that's the website. There are other agendas at work that may actually be more important than the spoken, than the stated agendas, which is actually why I started out talking about the excuses for war. Um, now we're getting into the real causes of war. So the way I would put that back to you is, have they really failed to achieve their objectives, the real objectives? And my answer would be, well, sometimes, yeah, they haven't even achieved their real objectives. But uh, frequently, they have made what they consider to be uh, important gains on their ultimate design of world uh, domination. It's not actually a secret. I'm not just inferring this from the data. Um, anybody heard of PNAC? Project for a New American Century. Dick Cheney, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Fife, those kind of guys, the neocons. Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal. Oh yeah, of course. How can I forget Bill Crystal? Um, they uh, they actually wrote this in a document, ironically or not, one year before 9/11, September of 2000, about their plan for world domination and included specifically attacking certain countries who all ended up on a list that was discussed with Richard Clark two weeks after 9-11. There were seven countries on that list. 
and they were all supposed to uh, undergo regime change in five years. That was the plan, and it wasn't new. Project for the New American Century was just the latest iteration. They had actually been talking about a lot of that. In 1996, there was a strategy for uh, reshaping, I don't remember the title, but it was a strategy paper for reshaping the Middle East. And it's basically what uh, they're trying to do now. And uh, that was based in large part on something that's called the Oded Yinon Plan, which was published in Israeli newspapers in 1982. And it, was, uh, it came from thinking that had been popular in both the US and Israel since the 50s. And the strategy of the Oded Yinon Plan was to uh, balkanize countries surrounding Israel so they couldn't challenge Israel's hegemony. And this was discussed in public in Israel. Didn't get much attention in the United States, if any at all. But this was actually publicly discussed. Um, so again, to come back to your question, if that is their real goal, then they're doing a pretty good job. They did a good job in Libya, right? They destroyed that country. Um, where else are they? Oh, Lebanon, they've attacked a couple of times. That's a pretty di ununified country now. Somalia. They're trying it in Syria, but Syria, amazingly, has stayed pretty unified. So, uh, you know, if, if you really have studied this, this plan and how it's played out, uh, you'd realize that Syria is standing virtually alone, although with the help of uh, Russia and Iran, the other two in the axis of resistance, um, they have borne the brunt of the front against the war on global fascism, or the, against the war of global fascism, I should say. Did we really defeat fascism in World War II? Yeah, we had the right? Yeah, that's right. You heard of Operation Paperclip? Yeah. Uh, where they brought over the Nazis, the propagandists, the people who are doing medical experience, experiments, the rocket scientists, uh, all of these uh, Nazi scientists, they, uh, they brought a lot of them to the United States, they relocated some of them in South America to keep them safe. They worked very, uh, oh, also security experts. A lot of the ones that went to South America were security experts. And they organized down there to uh, install right-wing governments that would cooperate with the United States. Have you heard of Pinochet being an example? Um, have you heard of Operation Condor? Where they assassinated leftists, thousands of them, just like they did in Vietnam in Operation Phoenix. Those, that's a, a legacy of us working with the Nazis. Um, as long as we're on that connection, does anybody know what Alan Dulles' job, he was the first director of the CIA, what his job was before he became the first director of the CIA? Investment banker. Yes, he was an investment banker. And they were working with banks in Germany, uh, Nazi banks. And they were uh, also working with uh, uh, some of the uh, Nazi production companies that were involved in the, their war production effort, IG Farben uh, being and one example. Bush family. As was the Bush family, right. And I don't want to get too deep into that one aspect because it's just part of the larger pattern. Uh, but yes, as what I started talking about was, are we intent on world domination? When I say we, of course, I don't mean the people in this room, but the people who actually call the shots in foreign policy. Um, is their ultimate goal world domination? Well, absolutely, it's corporate. Protection of Protection of capitalism, and, and really protection of crony capitalism, monopoly capitalism, uh, all the things that people who love the free market uh, claim to oppose, and yet rarely do. Everybody know Smedley Butler? You know the whole story? He was, he was uh, the most highly decorated three-star general in history in 1933 when he was approached by somebody representing a cabal of businessmen who uh, wanted him to lead an army to overthrow the Roosevelt government. 
How do we know this? He testified before Congress. It's on video. You can look it up and watch it. Remember when they taught you that in school? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> of course not. We never learn about things like that. America's a force for good. America goes to war for noble reasons. Sometimes we make mistakes, like Vietnam, right? It was a mistake. But we really regret it. We'll never do that again. He actually called himself a gangster for capitalism. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful book, and I really recommend uh, going and watching his testimony on YouTube. Yeah, there is, there is support from people who work in weapons manufacturing. Um, what's that? W which is distributed in all 50 states deliberately to make it uh, an economic issue for every representative in the House of Representatives and their senators. Um, but what's that quote? I'm sure somebody knows. It's very hard to convince somebody of something when their job depends, on, their uh, career depends on believing the opposite. Something to that effect. So, um, so you're, you're right, and, and that's the people in that industry. I would go a little further and say there's also a lot of support for almost every war uh, from people who glorify the military, who buy into the idea that we're the indispensable nation and it's our duty to impose the world order to keep it safe for Maybe. Del Monte. Or, <laughs> yeah, is that, yeah. American chauvinism. Yeah, American chauvinism, Israeli chauvinism, you know, the, the countries with the most power uh, become chauvinistic. They think they're, they're granted that by God, but there are a relatively small group of people who make the decisions, and we, we can talk about that. Uh, Council of Foreign Relations, for instance, represents a relatively small group of people who are influential in foreign affairs, and there's a real group thing going there. People who are more junior in the national security establishment, their careers depend on them buying into this neocon crap, which used to be considered crazy not that long ago. Um, so there's, there's that, um, but the, the people who are really calling the shots are the people in the think tanks who put a lot of pressure on politicians to do this or that, you know, because everybody in the foreign policy establishment agrees on it. Well, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't dare disagree. I mean, could you imagine Senator Merkley standing up and saying, well, the Russians didn't do anything wrong when they, uh, when they uh, recognized Crimea's independence after the vote. Uh, they were already there and they were mostly Russians. It was not surprising they voted 98% in favor of uh, separation and confederation with Russia. What the, they'd always been a member of Russia for centuries before that. And in fact, Ukraine only existed because Khrushchev uh, gave them uh, republic status in 1952 um, because they'd always wanted it. And he was from Ukraine, actually. Without any vote by the Ukrainians. Right, without any vote by the Ukrainians. <laughs> I've got a friend in, in Ukraine. He's an American, but he's studied the history really in depth. And uh, the actual people who are pushing for uh, for a Ukrainian nation independent of the Soviet Union was a relatively small group in Galicia. Um, I probably didn't say it right, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so they were nationalistic, they're fascistic, they fought, uh, their, their hero is Stephen Bandera, who was a, a, a vowed fascist who fought with Nazi Germany until uh, Hitler made it clear that he wasn't gonna favor an independent Ukraine, and then he started fighting the uh, Nazis too. But they massacred, uh, I don't know how many, probably millions of Jews, and uh, took, took part in the Holocaust. I mean, these are the kind of people that we're supporting now in Ukraine. They're the ones who got violent in Maiden. We, we've, we've got video of people who are positively identified who were associated with right sector, Svoda, um, who were doing the shooting. They were shooting both policemen and protesters because the point was simply to turn it violent so that they could stage a riot and take over the Rota, the Senate 
Uh, right. <laughs> right. Who who uh, got caught on an intercepted phone call talking about the five billion dollars the United States spent to uh, prepare them to stage a revolution. Well, actually, it's on video. Yeah. It is. Victoria That's right. She testified about it later. Five billion dollars yep. to bring about that revolution, and then she said, "Fuck." That's right. Remember when, when that was actually in the news that she said fuck the EU? It's on YouTube. She, it's she on said that and it actually made the mainstream news, but they obfuscated what the, what the conversation was about. It made no sense. I had no idea. If that's all I knew, I would have had no idea what she was referring to. We were behind the coup. And the, what was that $5 billion spent on? Anybody ever heard, besides you, Jack? of the National Endowment for Democracy. It's an NGO, which means non-governmental organization, and it's funded by Congress. Only on the CIA. <laughs> it is. In fact, uh, as is the USAID within the state. Right. The NEDs uh, was created in the 80s during the Reagan administration to take over the propaganda function of the, uh, of the CIA, so they didn't have to do it anymore because they got in trouble for... They were the pretty name. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, and, and it's really interesting the way, the way it works. There's several different agencies they fund. Uh, one of them is the International Republican Institute, I think it is, RIO. And that actually is literally funneled through the Republican Party. And so they support governments that they think are going to be more right-wing. Uh, not that's not a good way to put it. Aligned with, with their party, I should say. And then there's the, uh, the counterpart for the Democratic Party that goes through the Democratic Party. And they, call, they have the gall to call this a non-governmental organization. Okay, given that we, now that we kind of understand the real root causes of war, um, what can we do about it? And I guess I do need to make a couple of comments uh, before we start, because some things didn't get brought up that I think are really important. Uh, one thing, is that we, we talked about wars being essentially about controlling resources, but things are a little different now than they were back in the earlier wars where they were mostly about land or gold or um, things like that. Uh, now, uh, the world, or the US economy for sure, actually the world economy, depends on the stability of the dollar. And the dollar is not backed up by gold anymore. It's not backed up by anything but the petrodollar, which means that uh, if, uh, if most countries stopped buying oil in dollars, uh, all those trillions and trillions of dollars we put out there are not going to be worth as much as they were. Countries keep a lot of dollars in reserve uh, in order to um, buy fuel. Uh, the other thing they keep them for is to make sure that currency doesn't get devalued. They have to keep a certain amount of dollars. So those are the two ways that we can produce trillions and trillions of dollars uh, that are, um, you know, they, when they come back, they come back through weapon sales primarily. This is a huge thing that we have to face if we're going to organize to end war. We have to understand that, in, well, if we want to save the planet from climate change, we have to understand that what we're really up against is an entire system that's, uh, that depend, depends on fossil fuel dependence. And that's what our military's main job is, to uh, secure those uh, fossil fuel resources, or control them at least. And uh, so we have to figure out how we're going to make people aware of the real costs of war. And I will say that aligning ourselves with the climate change movement is probably the most important way that we can do that. Um, Krista and I just uh, attended something a couple weeks ago in, uh, in uh, with Corvallis. Corvallis, where uh, war, war tax resistors uh, sponsored it, and they brought together a bunch of people from 350.org and other organizations to, uh, to strategize about how we could uh, bring these two movements together to reinforce each other. Here's an interesting statistic. Uh, a jet, uh, a military jet operating for one hour uses as much fuel 
as the average uh, American driver does in two years. Just to put that into perspective. So anyway, uh, I promised Krista that we were going to talk about how can we use this information to organize to end war. So I'm going to open up the floor for suggestions. Remember when we, wars used to end? <laughs> as, as recently as 2006, we were talking about exit strategies. You never hear it anymore unless you watch the History Channel. Yeah, social media is actually quite important. And how you communicate is also very good. If you just communicate your anger, it's not nearly as effective as if you communicate, as Krista points out, what people can do. And do it in a positive way. And don't do it by demonizing people who probably, by and large, don't really realize how they contribute to the problem. Just state the facts in a positive way, what people can do, and that's the best way you can use social media, I think. I absolutely agree, and I actually put a lot of effort into um, promoting the idea of a constitutional amendment, for instance, that would uh, declare that money is not speech when it's spent to influence elections, and that corporations are not people. And there was a very big movement for that, which unfortunately largely died down because people treated it like just another issue rather than the root cause of most of these problems. Um, but it's building back up again. And if anybody wants to get involved, in, um, is it American Promise? You know, represent us. Represent us is forming a chapter in Albany. And they're going to have their first organizational meeting, I think, this week, if, or next week, I mean. So. If anybody wants to know about that, talk to me afterward, because I have it on my phone what day it is, but I don't recall offhand. So uh, you're absolutely right. The one thing I would say, though, is we don't need to do that first. We can also influence politicians by influencing the electorate. If we can make people understand what war is really costing us and make it an issue so popular that their reelection may depend on it then it's a completely different environment. That makes them relatively immune, uh, relatively immune from lobbying money. Money doesn't buy elections. It influences elections, sometimes heavily and sometimes less heavily. In 2012, when they spent, at that time, the highest number of dollars ever on the elections, they did an analysis, and a substantial proportion actually did not go to the person that spent the most money. The message matters. You have to find candidates. They have to be willing to put in the work. We have to do the work to support them. I mean, we have candidates all over Oregon right now running. We have a, a, Doyle Canning is running against Peter DeFazio. She's uh, running from the left. Um, Mark Gambia is running against Kurt Schrader. He's running from the left. Uh, these people are very, very anti-war. So how do we know that? Well, I, I don't know all about everyone, but I know that Doyle Canning has a record you can look at of, of opposing wars actively, not just rhetorically. And I'm not promoting any candidate because I represent a couple of nonprofits here. I'm just pointing out that's a fact. People who promote war appeal to fear. We need to consider that in how we message. And that's why I, one of the reasons why I said we need to do positive messaging. Um, and we need to uh, try to alleviate people's fear and make them feel solidarity with us and by, by pointing out the ways that we are all hurt by war and the ways we can all benefit by ending it. So that's an excellent point about fear. That's, that's something we have to counter. Okay, well, I gave an example. There's probably lots of ways you could explain it, but um, when you invest, uh, let's say, infrastructure, um, or better yet, if you, you, you know, the Ben Bernanke's helicopter money things, universal basic income would, uh, would be the best way to do it, because then it goes to poor people, and they spend everything 
that they take in, it, the, the multiplier effect, the number of times that dollar would circulate and be spent creating more GDP would probably be over, over two. The dollar would probably circulate several times before it's put in a bank somewhere and not invested anymore. Um, but the way the economy works right now, the, the estimate I've seen frequently is about $1.60 is produced by every dollar you put into the productive economy as opposed to the financialized economy so or the weapons industry. Because think about it. You put a dollar in a weapons industry, what do you get? You get, you get a bomb, and then it blows up, and you got nothing. Now, you do get some effect from uh, the people that, the workers that got the job, but you'd get that from whatever job you produced. And some of them, if you're producing something that's productive, you get a, a bigger multiplier effect. I think the most important thing we can do is talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Talk to our friends, talk to our family, talk to our neighbors. If you go to church, talk to your church members, you know, arrange speaking opportunities for people like Bart or me or Jack or other people that uh, understand a lot of this stuff. And uh, then you, you're going to them instead of them coming to you that way. That is really the key. And that's why I think that protesting really does have a role. If you have good signs, I mean, I don't call it protesting anymore. I call it demonstrating. I just was repeating what I heard. But I call it demonstrating. If you have creative signs that make people think, then you're going to be influencing some people. Now, are you going to change their mind on the spot? No. I'm a psychotherapist. I didn't change any of my patients' minds the first time I talked to them. But if they see it over and over, which is why I think it's important to hit the streets every chance you get, to remind people these issues are there whether they want to try to ignore them or not, and make them think. Like we had a uh, global climate change rally right here in Lebanon, and my sign said, what are you going to tell your children with a picture of the world on fire? So, and. The more they see in the newspapers, yeah, you know, uh, California's burning. Um, they, they're having power outages just to prevent fires, and, and on and on and on. Venice is sinking. Venice is flooding. Things that they thought were permanent. You know, sooner or later, it's going to sink in, that it's real. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I really admire uh, Tarek and his partner for what they're doing in Ireland. However, um, not everybody can afford uh, direct action. Not everybody can afford to go to jail or prison, uh, go to court, fly back and forth from wherever they're dem or get to where they're demonstrating in the first place. Anybody can just a second. Anybody can demonstrate, but it's just one thing. That's not even on the list of things I came up with, but it is something. Where, where people can be a part of it. Thank you, very well put. And I wish that would have been my response to, to Bart. Very well put. But, but again, it's, as you say, they need the, we need to get over well over 50% of the people backing the people that are doing that. And all these other things are ways to be a part of that effort. I know it's frustrating. I know we haven't won yet, but I haven't died yet, and I'm not going to quit trying until I do. I mean, unless we're going to violently overthrow the government, we need a, a, major, a good majority um, to, to make it. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the changes are going to come from the politicians, unless we have a violent revolution. Unless some, somebody else has a different idea, I, I don't know what other way we could do it. I'm open to suggestions. But anyway, so what I was going to say was, I try to focus on the more basic stuff. I'm getting into the grassroots here because people here are obviously pretty well educated. But what I had intended when I set this up was I get a more general audience, as I said before. And believe me, it would have been a different conversation because I would have had to spend a lot more time just explaining the basics to people. But we got to remember that's where most people are. They need the basics. If we're all the people that are most interested in are all digging down in the weeds about the details. We're not out there educating people about the basics that should turn them around. Uh, that's why right now my main focus is on trying to get people in the climate change movement, since it's a big thing with a lot of young people, to get these facts down. 
besides the new chapter of represent us, there's another thing uh, going on right now, and that's a divestment campaign. That's also something we can all participate in. And I think BART's been a part of that discussion. Veterans for Peace and Code Pink in particular are working on that in Oregon and in Corvallis specifically. So um, that's something people can do. Another thing we can all do as individuals is take our money out of big banks. If we have our money in uh, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, any of the big six, and some of the other ones, Take your money out and put it in a credit union or a, a, at least a local bank. Um, that's a, one thing that's very easy that any of us could do. Thank you all.